Oh, uh, okay. I, every time I think I've learned everything about space, we've covered everything, there's new stuff. We, ladies and gentlemen, are members of the board and hardcore supporters of the Central South Coast of California's Longtime Astronomy and Telescope Club, the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. And this is the SBAU Astro Hour, a weekly online blog using Zoom, focusing in on our old faces and our dens and, I guess, man caves and the latest space news, discoveries, cutting edge cosmology, hardcore astrophysics, man. Featuring some of the brightest, most knowledgeable people in town that I know. I do not include myself in that, but I'm on the board. <laughs> I'm uh, your host, your, <laughs> your vice president of the Astro Hour. We will meet the rest of the club's movers and shakers in a moment and talk for an hour. Meanwhile, watch us comment or question using YouTube live during the show on Mondays, 11 to noon, or plan on joining our club, SBAU. Come to our first Friday night of the month meetings or the second Saturday night star parties at Santa Barbara, California's beautiful Museum of Natural History. Check us out at sbau.org. What are we going to talk about this week? Man, this is the new stuff. Can you believe? Along with the solar system update, checking our uh, neighborhood with charts and whatnot, there's now a large, cold, volcanic comet going through our neighborhood. Can you believe that in our uh, solar system? Light pollution solution, perhaps, and moon dust. Who would have thought that's going to become a real problem? We may put roads on this lunar surface. A new study's out regarding dark matter. We'll get into that, man. This is weird stuff. Waves or particles. And why do we find heavy metals on the surface of the Earth? How come they're not all the way down inside? And what are HSEs? And how is it funny to have a laugh from some of the stuff that our man sends us. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's Jerry Wilson, who is beloved president, married to Pat. Jerry? Good morning. Six years and counting, or is it going on seven? Close enough. I guess we were both installed, weren't we? I'm the vice president, and you're the president. Uh, I was a year later, I think, and it's always on December we change. In fact, a uh, month after November. I think you became vice president when I left the position of vice president. That's no, true. no, it was. Um... It was Adrian. Adrian Lopez. Adrian, that's vice right, you're right. And he had to go off to Caltech. Yeah. Okay. Token young guy that we lost to Caltech. Chuck McFartland on the right there in front of the uh, Ukraine flag is our incredibly outrageously uh, outreachable coordinator of outreach. And I guess you're also a secretary for now? Uh, Co secretary. <laughs> oh, along with the merchandise manager, who you're managing yeah. to. And she's going to possibly take on a different chore if elected next month in December. Pat McPartland is his wife. Pat Forge is Jerry's wife. Uh, Tom Whittemore is on the screen at the bottom. Morning. He's Maureen, editor of SBAU's monthly newsletter. We all look, all look forward to. It comes in our inbox, but it's also printed, right? And we have it there at the I, first. I don't think we do, Ron. I don't think we do that anymore. The oh, print. okay. Saved a little money. Chuck? Here. Chuck, you, you don't you don't hand those out anymore to well, the yeah that's no, what we don't get a, a large run of prints and have them at outreaches anymore. Yeah, uh, there are there's a limited number of people that insist on getting a mailed hard copy, and so we we just okay. print them off at home and send them out. Oh, I see. Okay, I have a friend that uh, co-edits the uh, retirees of Santa Barbara County newsletter, and they got two thousand members, and it's mailed to every damn one of them, but it comes wow. out four times a year. So it's slick and it's about 16 pages. And son of a gun, if there isn't Tim Crawford joining us again. Hiya, <laughs> Timothy. Hi, Ron. Resident lens and telescope expert. And he went outside. <laughs> yeah, right. In front of, well, you're headed for Oz, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On your show, we're a longtime SBAU member. I uh, used to be involved with a Tuesday workshop. We have a telescope workshop still on Tuesday nights. And uh, his wife is Karen. We don't have Bruce today. I'm not sure why he's not on duty. Bruce Murdoch, a telescope enthusiast, wife Bonnie, president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Jerry, you send us these sillies. It keeps us in a good mood. And I counted six silly science cartoons or science stuff. So let's go to him and start the show this week with a little shot of what uh, most uh, <laughs> high school students out of <laughs> Europe <laughs> down south or out of fair you know that's exactly what uh, Jay Leno used to find on the streets when he interviewed people on his night show he'd go out and just dumb as 
rocks. There's, a, yeah. there's a number of other comet uh, com comedians and uh, oh yeah, yeah, talk show people that do that thing, and it's yeah. appalling how yeah, um, pandemic did not help at all. Okay, no. that's Europe, but got it. Let's go to another one here. There's a total of six I got. I think a five of them are going to be here. This was this is morning. Isaac Newton sitting under a big apple, about to discover the force of gravity the hard way. And one of his fellow uh, <laughs> intellectuals sitting nearby says, Nothing yet. Isaac, how about you, Newton? And then he became applesauce. Okay, two giant uh, Godzilla like aliens are eating the capital. <laughs> They're wondering. Don't eat that. It's got nuts in it. <laughs> I didn't see that. <laughs> good. They can't seem to choose a leader for their House of Representatives. Don't eat it or you'll choke. <laughs> good stuff. Godzilla. And here are a couple of uh, human-like looking aliens, I assume, and they're, uh, they're, they're Millennium Falcon coming close to the Earth, which is blowing up. One says to the other, as near as I can tell, you know, they're fighting over... Which religion is the most peaceful? <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. Peace on earth. Okay. And here are the stick figures with a defense of thesis or theses. Uh, the best thesis defense is a good thesis offense. Okay. I'm not as sure I got that. <laughs> is it a play on words? Is it a Whittemore pun? It's an uh -huh. academic joke. Yeah. Okay, thesis is like a uh, dissertation light. Yeah. No, it's dissertation heavy. It's heavier than a dissertation. Dissertation is a whole it, book. Isn't it? It's another, yeah, no, thesis is a whole book too. Did you guys have to produce one to get your PhD? Yes, uh -huh. and we yep. had to defend it. Well, we should have them on display at the meetings. <laughs> yeah, right. Stay on. Let's go. Well, that would them. perk everybody up. Wow. <laughs> Stick figures are us. What do we got? Is that it? Hmm. Yeah. I guess that is it. Uh, Newton, opposite, opposite of Jekyll and Hyde. Did you uh, guys get that one? That was a good one. You lost it. Remember Jekyll? Oh, that's right. I, I couldn't tell if that was one that we did um, last week or this week because it was it was dated the date of last week's presentation. So I thought we'd already done it. I can re no, I can remember the joke. It doesn't really need much. Uh, what's the opposite of formal to hide? Formal to hide. Why that would be casual to Jekyll. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's the whole thing. Sounds like an evening at Tom Whittemore's house. <laughs> okay, we got lots of stuff to talk about. Let, let's start with our solar system. That's what you started with in your talking points, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. Hopefully to be reelected in another month. There we are. A little blue so, this is what the moon looks like at eight o'clock tomorrow night. Oh, that's our moon. That's not us. Okay. That's that's the moon. Give us phase. Okay. And here's and a Tuesday night. We'll be at the big box. So it's telescope Tuesday. Oh, that's right. Yes. <clears throat> so we're getting into some the best the best viewing, of course, is along the terminator here because that's shadow rich. But we have a lot of features available here. Somewhere down here, there. No, well, this is a this is a, a map, not an actual photo, so it's a little difficult to find favorites every now and then. Would that be called three quarter moon? It's between half and full, so and just give you us. Call it that. Give us first half. This would be three quarter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tonight might be a good night to look at uh, Clavius. You know, might be a Clavius night on the south. Yeah. south. Clavius is down here. Mm -hmm. yeah, we One of my favorites. One of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Got to land there and find the monolith. And Ptolemy. Oh. And Copernicus. Mm -hmm. And somewhere down here is Tycho. Ooh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not showing real well, but it's there. No, because it's ray system is what sets it off. And the, the, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the ray systems aren't here on this map. The lunar Apennines. But you're going to get the best views along the way out here. And on the seas, when it's real low light, like sunrise or sunset, and of course, this would be sunrise here, um, you can see ripples in the surface of the, it's not completely flat. As the thing cooled, as it was once a layer of lava, and as it cooled, 
as all things do, they either expand or contract when they cool. Um, ice expands when it cools. And that's why ice cube ice floats on water because it occupies a bigger volume for the same amount of water. These things shrink as they, well, I don't know whether the lava does that or not, but you can see pressure ridges where things um, pushed against each other as they were freezing, as they were liquid, going from liquid to solid. So you can see all those stress features in the, in the sea at low light. And there's a lot of dust up there. We're going to learn that soon. Yes. I guess they're mostly in the Maris. There's not a lot of as much dust around. No. The, 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 well, the dust, you know, when we saw, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get, that's fascinating yeah. stuff coming we'll, your we'll, way. We'll figure it out when we finally land in Mare Cognitum down there. Yeah. Can I just ask one question about next April? There's going to be another eclipse. Will it be out farther away or closer in to get to obliterate the sun on the... Oh, it's a total it, over Indianapolis, and that's where I'll be. That's where I was born. I know, but we learned about perigee and apogee, and when it's closer yeah. in, it's a little bigger. The That's exactly right, and it will be a total eclipse because of that. Oh, no ring this time. No ring of fire. Right. Uh, I've turned into a burning ring of fire. Johnny Cash. That's, yeah. That's the man. Thank you, Mr. Black. So a quick review of our solar system. This is... Um, from the sky six, it shows the sun, and mm -hmm. near opposition to it is Mercury, and of course Mars is out here too. But you can um, you can see Mars before the sun rises, and uh, Mercury is not visible, not safely visible for a while yet. Mm -hmm. And oh, is this is this a photograph? Are those real no. spikes? No, this is a planetarium software called the Sky Six. I've never seen spikes like that out of any star. And they're just out. drawings. They're just drawings. The drawing. Okay, got it. And that's that's the evening side. That's right. Not the morning side. So Mercury, this one over here. Yeah. yeah okay, so Mars is seen in the evening. Right. Yeah, Chuck's right. Mercury's going to become an evening object. It's still pretty. I bet you it's still pretty tough to see Mercury though. Yeah. It's on wonder why we don't hear reports about the Parker probe. It's in there, isn't it? Close. Oh, yeah, you can look it up. Um, all the satellites are all online with current progress and where they are and what they're doing. And, and Ron, it's not like it's orbiting close to the sun. It it's comes really close to the sun periodically, but it's, it's in like a 21-day orbit. So it doesn't spend much time close to the sun. It, they're doing it the same way Cassini did it around Saturn and the Janus or Jaina or whatever the one around. Oh, no. It's like Juno around Jupiter. Yeah. 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 But one thing is it, it recently, when they made a really close pass the sun, they became the fastest spacecraft at something <laughs> like 350,000 miles an hour. <laughs> you know what you could call it is a mini uh, comet, almost yeah. a man-made mini comet. <laughs> if it gets to be a comet, then they're going to be in trouble with parts of their instruments coming off. True, yeah, if it gets a tail. Wow. Mercury has a nice tail in sodium light. Yes, that's not. true. Yes, I've heard that. What does that mean? Sodium is streaming off the planet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so why sodium? It gets ionized and pushed off by the solar wind. Mm -hmm. Sodium is not a heavy metal, is it? It's what, just a... It's an alkaline metal. It's a, it's close to well, they're all metals in astronomy. Yeah. But, uh, it's among that. the lighter elements, yes. So yeah, they're it's it's 11, heavier yeah. than lithium, but it's similar chemical properties. I think it's number 11. Yeah. Well, can I throw at you my real quick crazy question about the sun, and then you can use it as a topic someday? Would, would it be fair to say that the sun, and all the stars for that matter, lose weight? Over time, there are eons throwing solar wind particles along with light, which I know doesn't weigh anything. But why wouldn't that affect orbits at over a billion years? The sun no. or the star would get a little smaller, wouldn't it? Over billions of years, yes, that happens. Well, our sun has but, four, four billion years old. Why, why yeah, isn't it? Ron, Ron, well. there's stuff constantly falling into the sun, too. Mm -hmm. That's true. You're right. The, what you raised, Ron, is a current uh, theoretical debate, because as the sun ages, it's going to swell because of the 
generation of heat from fusing higher elements and the sun will grow and it will consume the orbits of Mercury and Venus, but they're not sure about the Earth. The Earth is close to where it might get consumed, but because of what you just said, over the next five billion years, the sun will lose enough mass that the orbit of the Earth may grow enough to stay outside of the sun. And different people have made models of that effect and they come, it's about 50-50 from my understanding. And it won't be as dense, but it'll weigh the same mass. Stars, stars frequently are not very dense, and, and you need to talk about the total mass, not the density. Uh, some stars are quite uh, tenuous. It's like a cloud in some cases. You could actually skip through the surface. The heat would be intense, but it's not like a hard object. Yeah, right. like, like Betelgeuse would hold a billion of our sun in volume, but it's only about 10 or 12 times the mass of the sun. Yeah, you so it's very low density. Science, you suppose science knows how many tens or hundreds of thousands of tons of matter is thrown out of the sun like every hour, every day? Sure, there's an estimate at least. Yeah, and that's what the Parker probe is measuring is what comes out exactly. And yet we know it's billions, millions of tons, but it probably doesn't affect the sun that much over time. Amazing, that's going to be a great topic someday. Depends how long the time is. Yeah, that's true. Okay, this is the morning sky. Here we're at 5 a.m. tomorrow, and we have Venus right square in the middle, just above the eastern horizon. Um, the um, a little earlier, I think Tom was pointing out that it's about 49 degrees or 47 degrees. 46 degrees up. 46 yeah. degrees up before, at um, by sunrise. Mm -hmm. This is the morning sky, so the sun is, you can see the slight glow from the sun coming up. This is just before sunrise. Oh. And it's super bright. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, it's very bright. Coming up at the Astro Hour, we're going to talk about the brightness effect, the luminous problems with pollution around the corner. Not necessarily now, but this would be a good night to watch, right? Without the street lights. Yeah, for the, if you get a clear morning, it's really good to be out there. Mm -hmm. See oh, this. It's very dramatic. Okay. This is the Venus is the morning star mm -hmm. currently. And, and Jupiter is just about to set. Kind of, It's low in the west, so you kind of get two bright beacons up there. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys, when you set up your scopes, when you zero in on Jupiter, do you see a planet or you just see a larger star, a larger bright? Do you see? Oh, no, you see, it looks like a double cheeseburger, Ron. You see two dark cloud bands and <laughs> you see the moons around it. Okay. <laughs> so you see the strata and the uh, cloud tops. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Jupiter is the easiest planet, in my view, to see detail on. Well, it, covers like about, it covers about 50 arc, sec arc minutes. Is that right? Arc seconds. Arc seconds. Yeah. Yeah which is almost a, a minute across. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose Saturn has not designed the same things with lines? And it does. It has cloud bands. Yeah, you can see cloud bands on it. It's not as pronounced as Jupiter. And it's lighter. Supposedly, they say if you had a bathtub big enough, Saturn would float. <laughs> but, it, but it leaves a big ring, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Whittemore, you missed that one. No, no, <laughs> I've heard Chuck say that every outreach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the only okay, so we have Jupiter here in the center in the evening sky. Mm -hmm. This is this is midnight, not the evening sky. Mm -hmm. And so this and Uranus is over here. Did I get another? Oh yeah, Neptune is up here. So these are these are Neptune and Uranus are not naked eye objects. Jupiter is. But if you find them and you look in them, these are about uh, two to four arc seconds across. So you can just tell them, you can just tell that they're not pinpoints, they're not stars. Yeah. And I think, Jerry, on November the 4th, Jupiter comes up opposite the sunset, if I'm right. Oh. Sound about right, Chuck? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's at opposite. So a marker for these is that this is right next to the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. Yep. Pleiades is up again. Someone asked coming. me about Neptune the other night, and I, I, I just didn't, I didn't know it was right where this chart shows it. I might have been able to see it at Westmont, but a lot of trees, Tim. A lot <laughs> of trees, a lot of trees there. Yeah. 
So this is. Yeah, moon and, and, and uh, uh, Capricorn. And Saturn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saturn is right here in the mm -hmm. in the west, setting at this time, and this is midnight. Also, this is okay. a different part of the sky. Neptune is here, and it's common to both charts. So, um, but Saturn is is past being overhead in the early evening. It's higher up, mm -hmm. and here is the Saturn Nebula, which we covered uh, one or two top uh, Mondays ago, and here's the gibbous moon. <laughs> on Tuesday night, uh, setting about midnight. Can I ask a dumb, another dumb question? Go ahead. If we somehow lived out on one of those gas giants, Jupiter or Saturn, or even Uranus and Neptune, and looked back, we had our telescopes aimed inward. I know when one of the Voyagers was on its way out and past the Grand Tour, mm -hmm. it took that little blue dot picture that Carl Sagan made famous. Mm -hmm. Would we be on the night sky if we were out there, but our little dots on the inner planets wouldn't go anywhere except around and around in the same place in the sky, wouldn't they? Yeah, we, we, we would be acting uh, to, the, to that probe as the inner planets do to us, you know, Mercury and Venus, they go around the sun, they have a certain displacement, a maximum displacement from the sun. So you can see them um, a little bit after sunset or a little bit before sunrise. We'd be in right. that category. Right, like kind of the way we see Mercury, huh? You know, so lots of retrograde, lots of back and forth. If there are- uh, well, we, get, we get lots of back and forth anyway with all the planets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the whole retrograde thing is like, ah, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> just, okay, moving on. All right, moving on. What are we, is this the, uh, the new visitor, the volcanic comet? This is the one at a while ago. This is the cryo volcanic comet. Ooh. And, and it's not new, Ron. It's, it's a periodic comet. Really? And the, the only thing that's new is it's in this outburst mode. And I saw a really disgusting headline this morning. <laughs> because of the way it looks mysterious devil comet returns <laughs> oh it's got the horns mm -hmm. it's 12 p ponds brooks it gives us the name of the two guys that found it i guess yeah yep. and uh it's coming in what every 70 years about like haley's yeah mm -hmm. i wrote it down somewhere and i haven't lo located but but they don't, <laughs> they don't normally uh disgorge jeff stuff do they they just sort of steam it off the surface. This is different. They do all sorts of things. Okay. This one has a volcano on it. But... Earlier image of this, and it looked like the Enterprise in, in Star Trek? Yeah, this is just like that again. It's doing it again. Oh, the oh, Millennium that's... Falcon. Millennium yeah. Falcon, yeah. It looks like the Enterprise or the Millennium Falcon to me. That's kind of, you're right. You can do either <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah. yeah, just flip but it this, around. This one has a volcano on it. And the volcano is spitting out a mix of ice, dust, and gas that is known as cryomagma. Yeah. <laughs> Similar to what goes on the surface of, of the moon uh, Europa? In some respects. Mm -hmm. okay. And in some oh, this What you see here, this roundish ball of fuzz, that's called the comet's coma. Mm -hmm. The tail would be farther out. This wasn't a long enough exposure to uh, show the tail. Mm -hmm. However, and you can see there's a couple of stars. Well, there's the. Um, this is actually two images overlapped, and the comet has moved this way during the two pictures. But all the other stars are double, which means there were two exposures. Yeah. This one back here has got like a fuzz around it, which is the tail of the comet. Um, with sun, starlight bouncing off of it, it's actually one star. And Ron, coma means hair. It comes from a Greek word for hair, and that's where comet comes from too, for hairy star. Right. The, the two the two things on the left are part of the tail. No, they're they're stars, and the tail material oh, is, is it, passing is in front of them from our point of view, and so they make them look fuzzier. Right. And the rock itself is the size of a small city. It said. Yeah. yeah, that's in here in the core, the nucleus. Okay, that's big. For and remember, it's nucleus, not nucleus. Yeah. <laughs> or 
nuclear. <laughs> no, nuclear. 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 It's, yeah. it's C L E A R. Clear. And put a new N U in front of it. Nuclear. Right. That's true. You're right. Okay. The N U, and you got unclear. It's unclear about that nuclear. <laughs> Uh, do they, so they, the, they come from either the Oort cloud or the uh, ast uh, the asteroid belt? Which where is this one from? Do Probably initially from the it, from the Oort cloud. Okay, or the Kuiper well, belt. I think it's from the either Oort cloud. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oort cloud. Ha have the Voyagers passed into interstellar space past the Oort cloud, or are they just no? The, uh, the the Oort cloud is is estimated to be two light years in radius. Well, hell, that's half the distance to uh, Proxima. Yeah, yeah. Proxima Centauri. I think it passed the heliopause, right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah. You can, yeah. you can really see this spaceship uh, in this this image here. Yeah. Okay. This shows it before the outburst and after the outburst. Oh, I see. So one's October 5, the other's October 7. Oh, wow. Well, we've known about this one all along, and yet Halley's is the one that gets all the attention. It doesn't. Well, Halley's do Comet can get naked eye visible, you know, quite bright, whereas this one tends to be not quite, not that way, although it might get naked eye visible in this pass. Mm -hmm. yeah. But normally they don't they don't have cryo. Yeah, they, well, in some, in some sense they do. Yeah. That's what's going on. That's the one we should have set a probe to. We've gone out and visited just to pick up a little dust. Well, they took close-up pictures of Halley's nucleus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With the, what, uh, um, what's the Giotto mission? Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Old man Haley turned over in his grave, didn't he? Yeah, I, I saw this in Tucson, uh, Naked Eye, the first part of 1986. It was Halley's, though. So. Yeah, Halley's comic. Yeah. And and if you if you see if you go to London and you go to the Greenwich Observatory, they have his original um, tombstone there, his marker, and it's it's uh, it was spelled H A W L E Y Holly. Huh. Yeah. They 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 were not really strict on spelling back in those days, so you'd see H A L L E Y and H A W L E Y. What what was the comet that we that uh, this was years ago? The one that was really prominent up in the northwest. There were two. I mean, oh, Hale Bob. Okay. Hale Bob. Okay. Hale Bob was a super bright one. There was Hiyakutaki that had the long tail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing that the thing that is that I remember from looking at that that was right before I joined our club, and it was that far back. But. Oh. The, you know, I think people expect to see a stream of of, uh, of the tail, you know, em emitting in, in real time. But it wasn't that way. It was kind of the tail was just kind of frozen. It was a frozen image in the real sky. Yeah. Hale Bob, they, Tim, early 97, 1997. Yeah. And they also expect it to move really quickly across the sky. They're expecting yes. a zooming thing. And, it, you no. know, it plays out over weeks and months. Yeah, it was it was up in the northwest for a long time, many many oh, yeah. nights. And then there was another one. I can't remember the name. But it had a Japanese name the year before that kind of went over the North Star. Yakutaki. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that was really neat. But it was only around for about a week that you could see with your eyes. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy that did a great sequence of photographs of that, like a time lapse, mm -hmm. where uh, as it was up near Polaris and the Earth was rotating. Mm -hmm. You've got like one of those uh, Catherine's wheel fireworks effects. <laughs> yeah. Well, assuming, so this, assuming, assuming that the, in the era of Haley, when he was alive, which was the late 19th century, 1800s. He was that, in the 1600s, Ron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it six, that long ago that we yeah, knew? Along with Newton, yeah. He, he was living the same time as Newton. Because I'm sure the ancients saw these things. What did they consider them? The same, just a star that's Aaron? Mad and, Omens. Bad news. Yeah. They regarded them as hairy stars or a star with a beard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks for the answer, gentlemen. So this comet is um, going to have its closest approach to the Earth on April 21. Happy birthday to me. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So it's coming in from, um, let's see, it's coming in from above the plane of the orbit in this drawing and going past inside the orbit of mercury wow. just 
And, Whoa. Well, that so, might be a perspective effect, but yeah. Yeah, it could be. It's out of the Oort cloud, then. It's coming down through our ecliptic. Or am I looking at it wrong? So no, when the comet uh, erupted this time, its coma grew to about 143,000 miles in diameter. Hmm. And it's about 7,000 miles, 7,000 times wider than the comet's nucleus. You don't know anything about ponds or brooks? When was their era? When, when were they looking at the stars? 100 years ago, maybe? This would have been 1700s, just judging from 12P, 17, 18, 1700s or 1800s. Somebody named Pons. Sounds European. Yeah, they back then they would have mostly been European scientists. I'll be damned. Son of a gun. You know, the kids grow up, they only know about Haley's. We got uh, every week there's a new one or two up there. It's amazing. Well, you're forgetting about 29P Schwassmann Wachmann, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is also being observed right now. And it's the most volatile volcanic comet in the solar system. It's much fainter, so it's only being studied with instruments. Well, this is too, but I mean, it's much fainter. And it has, have said, has had several noticeable uh, volcanic eruptions in the last year. You're talking ice volcanoes, cryo, right? Yes. Cryo magma. Don't suppose they have any that have Io, the uh, moon type eruptions, or Mount St. Helens type. They don't have hot eruptions on these things, do they? Mm -hmm. Hey, Chuck. So, you, uh, during the last eruption, this comet uh, spewed around 1 million tons of cryo magma into space. Wow. Well, Tim, what did you say? You know, you were talking about the you were you were saying what year this was. When you see the letter P in these comets, what is that? What is it means? How do you... It means periodic. It means they've had an orbit determined. Okay. And then twelve is the order. You know, so Halley's comet is one P. It was really? the first comet that they found a periodic orbit for. Okay. And there's two P, three P, and this is twelve P. So it implies it's pretty early in the sequence of. Okay, comets. that's why you said it was back in that era okay yeah okay Good, and the you. period of this comet is 71 years mm -hmm. how do they determine that if they don't have to wait 71 years to see it come you back you can determine any orbit <laughs> from three um observation three separate observations mm -hmm. is enough to define the conic section that it's on talking basic geometry or calculus i guess here aren't we well yeah, it's yeah, basic just, geometry yeah just gravity wow and, and and Halley's was seventy six year period. I think yeah. Mark yeah. Twain was Mark Twain was born. I think when and it came by yeah. and then he died when it was seen again. Yeah, right. Yeah, they they held him up as a little baby uh, and the uh, first passage for him, and then and he died in nineteen eleven. But before he died, he did he did see it. Huh. But now, if this was a Muamua's path, would it, it'd be a little different. Uh, curve or arc wouldn't it, it yes yeah it would be a straight. hype it would not be a closed curve because it's not going to come back that we know of god it. it was a hyperbola or a parabola right so it wouldn't win a p yeah <laughs> oh okay all right okay <laughs> yeah if, they, if they're not periodic it would just be c slash in the name oh, okay mm -hmm. okay fascinating okay want to go reclaim the darkness now or what are we doing here Ooh, and draw <laughs> What this, this is Andromeda Galaxy M31. It's not the usual picture you see. This has been corrected for the foreshortened view we normally get. So this is the photograph manipulated. So we're looking at the disk of Andromeda straight on. Face on, yeah. And you see when, when the stars and these other galaxies are round things. And so when they correct the galaxy for foreshortening, it, it turns these stars into streaks. Oh. So when, it, but, and so the, the streaks all line up on the axis that they corrected the, the uh, foreshortening for. Oh. But you see the core of the Andromeda galaxy is a streak too, but it's tilted. It's not the same streak. So it's, it's actually indicating that Andromeda galaxy is a barred spiral like we are because it has its own linearity to the core. And we can't tell that now with the angled view we get of it? You can't. It's not obvious um, yeah. from the angled view. 
But if you look up in Wikipedia, it will refer to Andromeda as a barred spiral. Uh, and and just, if you look at, you know, if you look at views of it, it does have an elongated looking nucleus. Right. Yeah. 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 Tim, Tim captured a nice uh, view of it on Friday night for the public at Westmont. It was pretty nice. Threw we, had a, we had a pretty good view of that. Yeah. Good. Huh. Well, you don't have so, you don't have to have a regular view, do you? To show us. Well, we've seen it a million times, so you're right. I've never seen a yeah. bar. You know, Ron, the best I've ever seen the Andromeda is in the dark skies of Utah with binoculars. Yeah. <laughs> it's so darn big. I think it stretches about five degrees, something like that. It's, 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 six, degrees, it's yeah. six full moons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's it's enormous. Yeah. It was what three fingers? Three fingers at arm's length. Wow. It's uh, eight eight full moons, one one okay. tip to the other. Okay, that that, that suggests four degrees. Yeah, four, four degrees. degrees. That's correct. They have binoculars in Messier's time. No, no. no. They had opera glasses, but the, they weren't optimized for looking yeah. in the sky. They um, were only one or two power yeah. opera glasses. Well, why don't we get the Poro prism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, apparently there were 30 other things that Messier categorized that had to be bigger and more splashy than I know. No, M1. M1 is really faint and small. Oh, yeah. 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 Is that right? Did that. What kind of drugs was he on then? Okay. Oh, he was hunting for comets. And as he stumbled on things, he put them in. It's not like he was saying, oh, there's a bright thing. Let's put that first. <laughs> I think we're looking at light pollution here, guys. Yes, yeah. uh, light pollution is a big problem for astronomy. Um, we used to have light pollution from high pressure lamps such as mercury vapor and sodium vapor lights. And those are basically a narrow line emission of light. And so you could buy a filter for your telescope that filtered out that light. And then you could see the, the dark sky without that bright pollution. But now we've switched to light emitting diodes, LEDs, and those are broadband they emit across an entire spectrum. And so you can't filter them out anymore. This one, and so they're looking for solutions to it. In my opinion, the best solution is to pass laws that um, cut down on the light. They have to face down, but still they scatter. And uh, we could cut that way back through legislation, but I don't think that's a likelihood. But this one tech company has come up with a technique that, um, they have demonstrated here. And this is uh, from, I think, a 24-inch telescope they used. They took a picture of some stars under normal conditions and then using their technology to reclaim the darkness of the night, they've um, taken the same picture and they've got a significant improvement in that. Well, go back if you can, Jerry. You know, it, it, especially if you blow it up a little bit, you're actually seeing more stars in the view on the left, at least more easily, because you can mm -hmm. see you can see another string of fainter stars in the, in yep, the light polluted yep. view that's harder to see in the darkened view. But yeah, they're still there, but they are harder to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, why is that? Well, the, these are processed images, and if you're trying to show that one's darker, you can set the dark background wh where you want. And, and, and another thing is their technique is actually cutting down on the amount of light you're gathering because they're in effect blinking the telescope at the same rate that they made the LEDs blink, except in oh, opposite oh, phase. Right. So, so they're, they're looking when the LED is off. Right. So there's still, there's still some scattered LED light coming back and, um, and you're looking at less total light. So that's why it's, it's, it's a little harder to see some of those faint stars on there, but it does return the the impression of a dark black sky. Yeah, and, and this it is does similar. not have visual observing. It's only for photographic imaging. Yeah. And this well, is similar it, to a technique somebody tried years ago uh, because even with the mercury vapor lights, they were saying, well, one, one thing you can do is you can put a large LCD across the front of your telescope and you can apply a current that makes the LCD go, go black. So you can, you can in effect blink your telescope. And this guy was saying, well, if you blink your telescope at the same 60 hertz rate that your local uh, street lights or 50 hertz, whatever they're blinking at, you, you don't notice, but your street lights are blinking on and off the whole time, at least the older ones. Then you could, you could blank out during the time the light was on 
and then open it up when the light was off. So very similar to what these guys are doing, but it didn't work because different street lights are on different circuits and they're blinking at different rates. So <laughs> now this was one, a nice try. This technology, yeah, but this technology blinks them at a faster rate. Yeah. That, that is, you actually have to have two devices, one to go down into the village and hook up the all the city lights down there to blink at this one specific rate. And then you have your telescope uh, opening and closing a, a rapid shutter. So it's only open when the LED is off. Ah. But it implies you have to have really strict synchronization between your telescope yes. and the yeah. street lights. Right. Do you happen but to they, know what those stars are? What, the what? what the, constellation we're looking at? Oh, I, I have no idea. They didn't mention. That's a tiny field of view of yeah. just obscure stars are on. Yeah. Okay. This is the telescope they used for that. It's a 24 inch telescope. This is their device on the back end of it. Another view of the telescope. Um, but uh, I I don't see this as a practical solution. No. I think we're going to have to, we're just, the big stuff is going to be built still high up in the Andes and far away from city lights. Um, for us, I think that we need to be active with the dark sky. What is it? Association. They've changed their name again. There's something like mm. Dark Sky International. Okay. Um, but but you know the real problem now is we're putting we're putting the lights up into the hundred mile above us space. So with all these uh, mini satellites and things. So th that's that's another problem too. Yeah. Well, how does that affect you? It just goes across your lens in the middle of viewing a star. Yeah. It's a bright object that suddenly is passing through your field of view, and a lot of these synoptic survey telescopes are looking for asteroids and comets that might be heading towards the Earth. And now they have to filter out thousands of these garbage yeah. tele uh, garbage satellites up there that let you stream Netflix from Antarctica. <laughs> now, when, you, when you process images, you get transient <laughs> events captured on your film or on your image, but it's easy to filter out transient uh, images like that when, when you do post-processing. But as Chuck points out, these survey telescopes are not doing po it post-processing. They're, they're trying to filter it in real time as it happens. Wow. And so the, that becomes a problem for them. You remember when we had the astronomers from that little private school over in Ojai as a school yeah. a couple of years before the pandemic? And they yes, said that's true. That's true. it solved the problem over there. Uh, somehow, I guess, Ojai Council or something dim the lights and... Well, as Jerry said, they have legislation limiting what lighting can go in. Got it. Maybe you ought to have them back <clears throat> now that LEDs are in. <clears throat> well, I got that, isn't, that isn't what they were talking about, though. They were talking about their telescope. And yeah. it's interesting. They just were in the news uh, because they uh, observed something. And I can't remember what it was, but it was an interesting article that, that they were one of the contributors to. I think they just fired their uh, telescope up again, open their astronomy after being closed for many years. That's basically what it was. I well, they were, no, no, it was, they were still using it for their students. And this was something yeah. that they had, uh, that Thatcher they had school, right? I wish I could remember. Thatcher, right? Thatcher. It's yeah. a Thatcher school, Chuck, yeah. Yeah. We got one member over there, Rex Meach. Anyway, where are we? We're on the moon. I got <laughs> dust everywhere. God bless it. Okay, now you asked earlier if the Mare showed a lot of dust. Right. This is a picture. I, this is Apollo 17's lunar rover. And uh, I think they are on Amare. They're not among the craters, the, the heavily cratered areas. Uh, so there's a was, lot of dust here. This was near Hadley Rill, I think. So they, they tried to go close to some of the mountains. You're, okay. you're, ready, you're ready for the song of the hour? When the moon dust hits your eye like a big <laughs> pizza pie, it's Amare. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's awful. Well, I, just, I like it. The moon is in that lyric, right? Okay, what do we got? Okay, so that's um, dust, it turns out, is a big problem. Um, when people went back inside their Apollo lander in here and took their suit off or at least opened the helmet, they had some dust that came in with them. And the dust is uh, very, it's like mirror grinding grit. It's real sharp and jagged. <laughs> It doesn't get rolled around in the ocean waves to break all of the points off of it. So it's very sharp and abrasive. And they said it smelled like spent gunpowder in there. 
And um, it also um, came in with them and the seals on the spacesuits and the seals around the door of the module were, were uh, starting to leak because of the um, abrasion of the dust, the, just the little few particles that clung to their suit. And it, it clings electrostatically, so it's a real nuisance. It's hard to get off. It doesn't just fall off you. I have to say, Jerry, this is one of the most fascinating subjects that you had in your talking points. I, I oh. really like this. Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt again. Uh, the Thatcher School thing they observed was they were watching the um, Diddy Moon, you know, Dimorphos, that was oh, hit yeah. by the impactor, and they were monitoring the orbit. And they noticed that the orbit was uh, continuing to change uh, even, even after the initial impact. And so there's like still effects from this uh, cloud of debris that they splashed out of it. And uh, so they were one of the first to announce that, hey, we're, we're seeing the orbit still shortening a little bit. So there's still stuff going on we're using that Dimorphos, observatory. What did it orbit? What, what did Dimorphos orbit? Well, it was Dimorphos or orbiting Didymos. It was the binary asteroid where they did the DART impact just a oh, couple of months ago. Has that oh, really? Well, that was that long ago? Yeah. Are you sure? Okay. But uh, this this dust is created by countless meteor impacts, pretty much, isn't it? Yes. Right? Because uh, those Mares, I thought, was solidified lava. They lava, are. Lava is not dust. No, but they they solidified a long time ago, and uh, the moon has gone through apparently two great bombardment periods, and continually gets some bombardments that make new dust. Every time it gets hit, it makes a pile of dust. Yeah. So you whack a piece of lava, you're going to get dust. Yeah. Well, some interesting things happened. Uh, which was it? The the Apollo seventeen, or was it? 13 no 13 never made it but uh one of them got uh the the road yeah this is this the one that lost its fender and you can see it there see the rear wheel yeah where they see where right they patched on a fender yeah. oh yeah right okay and that's because of dust no that's, that's because... to keep the keep the wheel from throwing dust up the fender came off i don't remember why it came off it had a fender yeah. <laughs> hit by a golf ball <laughs> <laughs> there we are so this is um what is this this is apollo 12 and, and uh look at that they've walked, they've walked over to surveyor three which was a uh, lander earlier on and this was in the early 70s and so they they had some bolt cutters and they took a lot of cables off of here and they brought it back to hughes aircraft company for examination. It might have gone to other places too, but I was working at Hughes at that time. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, things that uh, uh, don't respond the way or don't act the way you want them to act under continual proton bombardment from the sun. So insulators had become non-insulators and it turned some had turned to powder. So um, <clears throat> it was a engineering uh, informative learning moment teaching what is it learning but yeah but so, from your from your yeah. notes from your notes jerry i recall 180 miles away from where apollo 17 set down it splashed it that far to hit that uh lander there oh yeah. i think it was 180 meters was it look at, yeah. look at the dust on that on that guy's legs yeah I'll be damned. So they, we landed there on purpose because of that land. Yes, right? they did. They wanted to get the, some parts off it. Engineering knowledge um, is sort of an unsung mission, but key to it. Uh, NASA doesn't let us put things up in orbit or send them out on spacecraft unless they're demonstrated to be low risk. And you have to put things up in orbit and let them sit there for a while to see how materials respond, paints respond, insulators respond. Um, and then you have to bring them back or go up and measure them. And so they send up these engineering missions all the time. We made a satellite one time that was only 25% um, populated in sense. It was an imager, but you just had samples of uh, equipment on there. It was only 25% of the electronics, 25% of the uh, photo detectors and stuff. 
that was set up there just to see how things would perform. And uh, when we had the space shuttle, some of these things were captured and brought back. And in this mission, they captured it by walking over and taking some stuff back. But they send up these uh, engineering missions quite frequently or used to. Now I'm sort of out of the loop on that. I hope I didn't miss this in what you were just saying, but this isn't that laser reflector thing, is it? No. no. That's a cube. That's a, a French made cube. Yeah, the corner cubes. Mm -hmm. And those were left by the Apollo astronauts and on the Lunokhods, yeah. the Russian yeah. rovers. Really? So anyway, with all this dust around, you're going to have um, Elon Musk trying to land one of his rovers on the back, um, going down back first and landing. That's going to throw up a lot of dust. It's going to get everywhere. It's going to cling to things. And so he's going to really need uh, to have a paved landing pad up there somehow. <laughs> and the um, other missions are going to need that too, if we're going to build habitats up there and drive around much on there. So the idea is to take the lunar regolith. This is inside a chamber. And this is a, what, a 10 kilowatt laser that's melting simulated moon dust. And it's forming it into a ceramic glass-like solid. Yeah, triangular. Yeah, and then these things, this shows a better view of this roughly triangular shape. And this is the unmelted um, regolith. It's a it's a couple of centimeters thick. And the idea is to interlock them like this to form a mat, a paving mat, similar to what was used on um, in World War II for landing mats on um, sandy beaches in South Pacific Islands for warplanes during World War II. They had these st interlocking steel mats that um, were full of holes, but they provide a, a surface for the wheels to run on. And that's the same idea of showing it here. Marsden matting. What's that again? It's called Marsden matting. Okay, good. Jerry, won't the, won't the holes in this surface still kick up a significant amount of dust? No, the, those Marsden mattings don't do that. They, they've used them quite effectively on places where it's tamped broken coral or sand, where you get too much dust, but you put the Marsden matting down and it works fine. Oh. Uh, the wheel doesn't actually touch the dust. And here it shows a, a landing pad um, coated with these interlocking triangular pads, but they're going to have to do something um, in order to, because the dust is very destructive. Now you mentioned in, in your uh, notes that uh, they're using a laser to do this in the lab, but on the moon, they're going to be using a Fresnel lens? A Fresnel, you don't pronounce the S, it's a French word. So you get to Fresnel. pass over several word letters. So it's Fresnel. And it's a great big, it's, so you've got, seen these in museum stores. They're a big sheet of plastic that has like radial circles carved in it on the surface that you can just barely see. But you put it out in the sunlight and it, it's like an F1 lens. And just a small one, you couldn't, you couldn't put your finger in the, at the focal point. You'd burn it. But with big oh. ones, you can cook or uh, melt things, melt stones, all sorts of things. So they would use sunlight, which is quite intense on the moon. Yeah, Fresnel lenses are often used in lighthouses too. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I, I got to look that Which up. Which are now being decommissioned. You can buy a lighthouse now. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's actually true. Um, and some of them are, are really, uh, you know, it's quite attractive offering. They're very low prices, but you got to agree to renovate them and live in them. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Chuck. Yeah. This sounds like a deal like those villages uh, in Italy where you can buy a, a, the whole town. Yeah. These moon pavers are going to be fried by a uh, into a mold. Uh, aren't they going to have uh, 3D printers on the moon, too? That could that's, do the same thing. That's another plan that they have. They um, put out the this organization. Uh, let's see. I'm just wondering how they're going to gather up all the dust. That's going to be a nasty job. No, the dust is just laying there. You just flatten it out and then burn it. Oh, is that right? <laughs> you don't move it into a big concrete mixer. I... Nope, nope, nope. 
just you just melt it right on the surface. Oh. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it, it, three centimeters, that's pretty thin. It, mm -hmm. it, 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 would, it would crack, wouldn't it? Depending how heavy um, a thing ran over it, yeah. But you got one six gravity, that's helping you. Yeah. yeah. And the, underneath, it's got the padding of the dust. The dust is a fairly forgiving surface. Mm -hmm. This project and this idea came from a call run by the Discovery Element of European Space Agency's basic activities through um, a, a call for papers. What is that? When they uh, an RFP, a request for proposal. Awesome. Yeah. And the, there were 69 offerings. Of those total, 23 uh, ideas have been implemented for test based on an evaluation panel by ESC, ESA. And this is one of those uh, suggested panels or one of yeah, those. For, the, for those listening that are interested, I, I went to the ESA uh, website and I think there's a, I think it's space and exploration tab that you click to get to that. And then one of them is about this project. Yeah. It's it's fat. This is really fascinating stuff. It is somehow it's going something like this is going to happen. Yep. Well, that could have fit right in Kubrick's movie, couldn't it? Right. Kubrick movie had uh, very elaborate um, landing systems. You know, big steel doors like on top of a ICBM launcher pad. You know, they open up and the spaceship descended down into a steel platform or something or concrete platform there's all sorts of things that they're going to do or that the uh, hollywood has come up with yeah it was one of them that big bulbous round thing that the yeah. uh, your floyd took uh it opened up like the peels of an orange and then it settled down in the subterranean and kicked up dust that flew into the non-atmosphere <laughs> which wouldn't have happened like that sure you know, what kicks up dust the dust doesn't form clouds and stay suspended. It just it's, follows individual ballistic trajectories and lands somewhere else. Yeah, it goes straight out. Yeah. There's actually a, a line of cloud that, that is low that moves around the moon along with the Terminator. Because yeah. as, as you go from night to day and the, and the temperature changes so much, you can get this stuff spalled off and uh, electrostatic forces kind of hold it up. So you get this little moving cloud that follows the Terminator. Wow, wow. Well, Kubrick's spacesuits were nice and streamlined and colorful. I wonder if we'll ever get them that sharp. And The um, ones yeah. that uh, Elon Musk is coming up with have taken over. NASA's adopting the suits. Is that they're right? Very, they're much more stream. They, they fit the body better and they're not, not so bulky. Oh, it'll be well, and I don't think those are for actual on the moon. Those are for the no. space travel. And, and, and yeah, also, and NASA has, has contracted, I think, with Gucci to design some of the gloves. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of silly, I guess. But. Are oh, you serious? Goes, yeah. There goes the budget. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to save uh, the dark matter theories till next time or get into the next? The next two things require some discussion and explanation. So we'll do those next time. Oh, and, man, dark matter. We've got a new theory that I tend to agree with what you said in your talking points, Jer. Fascinating stuff. What's next on the horizon, if I can use that word, Mr. Outreach? Uh, this Friday night, are we going to be at Westmont? No, no, that was we, last Friday. Oh, I missed it again, damn it. Yeah, Tuesday night is Telescope Tuesday, so that's our last event for the month. And okay. then November, um, of course, we have the normal star parties, uh, second Saturday uh, at the museum, uh, third Friday at Westmont, and, and fourth Tuesday at Camino Rail Marketplace, plus a bunch of the schools are ramping up uh, with science nights, and we could really use some, some outreaches for those, because lately it's just been, you know, a lot of Pat and me going to these schools, but be nice to have a few more telescopes. And we might be in the Ojai Valley. I'm not going to give away that, but that's... No, I, I, I don't think so. Negotiated. It's not going to work. Fascinating stuff, as usual. Let's not forget the Telescope Tuesday. That's tomorrow night. Who's in charge? Jerry, are you going to be on board? No, I, I do the workshop at the same time, so... That's right. probably going to be Pat and me and Martin and Janet if they're in the neighborhood, but I don't think they are. Um, and sometimes Edgar shows up. And how does the the membership get involved? How do they tune in? Do they, you don't watch on YouTube, right? Can Show you get up. a Zoom connection? 
No. Nope. Well, that's for the for the oh, telescope for the workshop. workshop. Yeah, there's a Zoom connection. Oh, okay. But you got to request it. Yes. Okay, gentlemen, take care of yourselves and your wives and uh, get your third COVID, COVID. I guess there's another Pfizer coming, Tim. I got it already. I got the Moderna. Okay. I did. Yeah, me too. I got, oh, I got Pfizer. Did you? I got the yeah. RSV and my flu shot. And I guess, mm -hmm. and I live alone, so nobody infects me. Awesome stuff. <laughs> Except us. Yeah, it's the SBAU Astro Hour. Thank you, Jerry, Chuck.